This year marks the 40th anniversary of the creation of the PG-13 rating, and since that time it's had a substantial impact on the film industry. It's the money rating. But how exactly did we get to this point? This is the first in a three-part series examining the themes, inspirations, and history What have I done? behind the classification that would affect billions of lives around the world. And in the past year, we've gotten a new Indiana Jones film, Godzilla film, King Kong film, Joe Dante just announced he's working on a remake of a Roger Corman film. The timing literally cannot be better. So strap in and make sure to hit subscribe so you can find out about episodes 2 and 3 where I interview some directors who were there at the very beginning. Cue the music. <laughs> In the spring of 1933, U.S. audiences would get their first look at the latest cinematic marvel, King Kong. The first motion picture to make a special effect one of the lead characters. It was both a significant technical achievement and pushed the envelope for what was allowable on the screen. Although tamed by today's standards, these scenes of graphic violence were shocking for their time. So much so that when the Hays Code came into effect the following year, various scenes were trimmed for content. This footage would seemingly vanish until being rediscovered in the late 1960s. It was at a screening of the original uncut version in 1933 that a young boy by the name of Raymond Frederick Harryhausen sat in awe of the screen. Employing miniatures, stop-motion animation, matte paintings, and rear projection, Ray was awakened to another world where anything was possible. Of course, I didn't know how it was done at that time. Uh, stop-motion was a uh, secret. Uh, they kept it uh, hidden for a good many years. And the effects animator, Willis O'Brien, became his personal hero. A few years later, when the two were able to meet, O'Brien would examine Harryhausen's early designs, advising him to take classes in art and sculpture. Ray listened and was soon juggling both high school and night classes at the University of Southern California. The work would eventually pay off, and after a few commercial animation jobs and a stint in the army during World War II, Harryhausen would finally get to work alongside his hero as assistant animator on the 1949 film Mighty Joe Young. While Willis O'Brien would take home an Oscar for the film's special effects, some accounts state that the animation was almost entirely done by Ray and the film represented a passing of the torch. Harryhausen wouldn't get to work on another feature for another several years. Stop motion photography isn't for everyone. I think there's just a handful of people who can really uh, stand the pressure of, of, shall we say, patience. And in that time, the media landscape had entirely changed. The years following the bomb drop on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, along with the confrontation of potential nuclear war, led to the American public's fascination of the effects of radiation and nuclear fallout. I can't stress enough how much you probably can't conceive of what it's like to actually think that the world is going to end, but it was it was very heavy. A subject matter which naturally lent itself to the burgeoning horror and science fiction genre. After a successful re-release of King Kong, producers Jack Dietz and Hal Chester decided to combine the theme of nuclear paranoia with giant monster films. When Harryhausen was brought on to do the effects, he informed Dietz and Chester about a story his friend Ray had written in the Saturday Evening Post 
titled The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The short story by Ray Bradbury featured a giant monster attacking a lighthouse. The producers, wanting to capitalize on Ray Bradbury's success, brought him into the fray and plastered his name all over the marketing. The combination of sci-fi horror author and animation phenom proved to be a powerful one. The film was a huge success, grossing the modern equivalent of $50 million. The destruction of a city and revolutionary stop-motion effects would have a substantial impact on cinema history, and in the era of 3D, it wouldn't be long before the new screen gimmick was the atomic monster. The next year would bring both the iconic film, Them, and Isha Rohanda's classic, Godzilla. To Japan, a country which was still coming to terms with the after effects of the nuclear incident, the film came at precisely the right time. As producer Tomoyuki Tanaka put it, the theme of the film from the very beginning was the terror of the bomb. Mankind had created the bomb, and now nature was going to take revenge on mankind. And although Harryhausen later referred to the film as a filch from the beast of 20,000 fathoms, it didn't matter. Godzilla was a monster that was just as iconic and socially relevant as King Kong 20 years prior. After the film's massive success overseas, Toho sold the American rights and a heavily altered Americanized version, which almost completely removed the political overtones, was released in 1956. In 1957, in an Arizona theater, a young boy named Steven would watch Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and vow to one day make his own monster films. 18 years later, he'd get his chance. Slower ahead. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chum some of this shit. In the nearly half century since the film's release, the production history of Steven Spielberg's Jaws has become the Hollywood legend. You're gonna need a bigger boat. When he picked up Peter Benchley's novel about a great white shark terrorizing a small island community, Spielberg immediately knew that this was the monster film he had been destined to make. Other than a few short films and some television work, he had only one film under his belt, 1973's The Sugarland Express. The 27-year-old had yet to really prove himself on the big screen. Now was his chance, and the ambition that would later conquer the world was immediately apparent. He wanted to shoot on the ocean, entirely unheard of for the time. Lake water, pond water, tank water doesn't have the same texture or even violence that, this, that the ocean has. And this needed to be a convincing story about a great white shark because if it wasn't, nobody would really believe it. And employ the sort of practical effects that pushed the limit of what was even possible. He wanted a cast of characters that the audience not only enjoyed, but laughed at and saw themselves in. While his intentions were noble, Spielberg had no idea that his film was slowly becoming a monster of its own. The shooting Jaws was really a, a, a living nightmare. I dreamt about it at night, woke up with that sick stomach in the pit of my gut. I felt that I was the eye of the hurricane. You know, all this fell on me. As scripted, the shark prop Bruce was initially meant to take up larger portions of screen time, but constant breakdowns kept this from ever becoming a possibility, and this is when the classic film began being made. The frequent delays in production allowed Spielberg and the Martha's Vineyard crew to take the film in an entirely new direction. Without a shark to show, the crew had to rely on a combination of underwater footage and clever editing, implying the creature as a constant foreboding presence. When John Williams' iconic score was attached to the footage. You see that shark when you hear that music. Spielberg was able to rely on the audience's imagination. I just went back to Alfred Hitchcock. What would Alfred Hitchcock do in a situation like this? So uh, imagining a Hitchcock movie instead of a Godzilla movie, I suddenly got the idea that we can make a lot of hay out of the horizon line. And, and not being able to see your feet, not being able to see anything below the waistline when you're treading water. What is down there is what we don't see, which is really, truly frightening. This focus on prolonged suspense combined with a cast the audience sympathized with allowed for more explicit moments of shock to have a greater impact. The discovery of a floating head, various fountains of blood spray following attacks, and the death of Quint were perfectly timed by Spielberg and his editor Verna Fields to elicit an almost primordial fear of both the shark and the unknown mysteries of the ocean itself. <laughs> and along
along for this journey. Our three leads represent the dichotomy of man. Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss, is the young scholar who believes that technology and intelligence can outmatch his inexperience. Robert Shaw as the grizzled Quint represents the intensity and ferocity of the previous generation, entirely alien to the other characters. This is a man who has seen and done everything. And smack dab between these two worlds, the audience surrogate, Chief Martin Brody, represents the battle of man against nature, the bureaucracy, and his own internal fears. I just needed somebody vulnerable that the audience could hang their hats on and say, I'm with you. You know, if, if you show fear, then I'm going to really feel fear. This ordinary man that's confronted with this 60 million year old conflict. Who's going to survive? On a seemingly endless ocean, the characters were taking us on a journey from the safety of childhood to the grizzled experience of adulthood. After filming had wrapped, it was edited down by Spielberg and Verna Fields, who notably removed several sequences they thought might be too intense. I'm in a boat, in a little rowboat, and the way they shot it the first time, where I'm in the shark's mouth with a blood pack in my mouth, going underwater on top of water, and then I see Roy's son staring at me and as a last ditch effort the shark is heading right towards him and I just make a move to grab him and I let him go and then I go underwater and disappear. Well what happened in that scene is it was so violent and so horrendous that they couldn't use it. It was just too violent, period. And I was in this little bucket seat strapped into it and the shark fin was behind me on a sled. I had the kid in my arms and I was going to take him underwater, and then I let him go, and then the, the sled went underwater. That's much more horrible than what I had done, you know, you know, um, in the first third of Jaws. I just didn't like it. It was too bloody, and I thought it was in bad taste, so I cut it out. Soon after, it was shipped off to the MPAA for a rating, where it landed in the hands of newly appointed chairman Richard Hefner. The rating of Jaws was a real cliffhanger. It was essential from the standpoint of MCA Universal financiers and distributors that Jaws get a PG rating. The previous year, he had developed a name for himself as being particularly tough on violence. He was the man who had given an X rating to the Street Fighter. He found Jaws almost excessively violent, but far more shocking was the intensity. The constant terror that loomed over the audience was surely too much for a younger viewer. Hell, Quint's speech was enough to induce nightmares. Since the creation of the ratings board in 1968, war had gone from being seen as something for children to one of notable concern. Quickly, before he wakes. You must do it now. In the late 60s and early 70s, a movie like Dracula is Wisdom from the Grave, which starts out with an extremely gory staking that would get an R today, was a G. And the reason it was a G was because it was considered that horror movies were basically for kids. And so nobody gave really much thought about the level of violence. That changed immediately. But unlike previous horror films, the death scenes in Jaws were grounded in reality rather than fantasy. Our argument was very simple with Hefner and his boy. Nobody impersonates a shark in like films of violence. No one is going to go get up and eat somebody. Nobody's going to drag someone down in the water. What happens in nature is part of childhood's experience. Anyone who's read Grimm's fairy tales, Red Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood is one of the scariest stories ever written. Uh, you know, and, uh, and children are regularly terrified. Whatever the ratings board said to Scheinberg and Wasserman, they told Dick and David, who came to me as my producers, and said, Stephen, in order to get not an R rating, but a PG rating, you need to cut some frames from the leg coming down. And I was happy to do it because they didn't ask me to cut the leg out. They just asked me not to let the leg hit, bounce, gush blood, settle, because I was really sort of studying it. So I cut a, about a foot and a half to two feet off that shot. You just see the leg come into frame. This when you see it severed, and it just starts to hit the silt bed and cut away. For that reason, Hefner believed that the violence was unlikely to be imitated 
and gave it a lower rating. You can sense they attempted to do something because the final marketing for the film bore the moniker may be too intense for younger children, something that it still bears to this day. Of course, all that did was bring them in. But the one thing Hefner could never predict was just how many people would end up seeing this film. After receiving a rating, Universal spent nearly $2 million on marketing, much like with The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The production studio heavily marketed Peter Benchley's novel prior to release. This, combined with a staggering $700,000 on a revolutionary televised marketing ad, Jaws, see it before you go swimming. At a nationwide release in nearly 700 theaters, it was practically assured that this little monster film would be seen by a lot of people. And when it released to theaters on June 20th, 1975, it exceeded every expectation imaginable. To call it a massive success would be an understatement. Jaws is the success, the archetype for Hollywood studio blockbusters from that point on. By the end of 1975, not only was it the highest grossing film of the year, it was the most successful film of all time. And while audiences loved it, and critics praised the direction and characterization, they didn't free it from criticism. Charles Champlin of the Los Angeles Times was extremely critical of the MPAA and their family-friendly rating, stating, quote, Jaws is too gruesome for children and likely to turn the stomachs of the impressionable at any age. It is a coarse-grained and exploitative work which depends on excess for its impact, an impact that wouldn't take long to be felt. The scene where the shark comes up and the boy is brought underwater a person got up and started to leave and I, th I thought oh my god my first walkout and the person began to run I went oh my god it's not a walkout it's a run out he's fleeing the premises and the person passed me heading for the restroom didn't make it and threw up on the floor of the lobby of the medallion theater and um and i thought i at that point i thought oh my god i've gone too far I should have I should have edited this picture more. What have I done? And this wasn't the only case. The film was so notable that it became the subject of an entire area of study by Brian R. Johnson. His 1980 findings listed Jaws as second only to The Exorcist in its ability to elicit stress from the audience. And although he wasn't able to find out what exactly was the most stress-inducing element, a 1986 follow-up found that almost universally it was the violence. What have I done? I don't recall any letters from children about children being having bad dreams. I had many about adults having bad dreams and never going by the water again. But that didn't matter. By this point, Spielberg had bought himself the sort of clout that could make anything happen on the screen, and things were only about to get more interesting. In the aftermath of the release of Jaws, just like with Godzilla, there were many copycats. But the one which Spielberg dubbed the king of the ripoffs was Joe Dante's 1978 Piranha. They're here. They're hungry. They'll eat you alive. Who can stop them? The film was a Roger Corman production, the same man who had given early life to the careers of Francis Ford Coppola, Ron Howard, Martin Scorsese, and dozens of others. A legend in the exploitation world, Corman was also no stranger to the creature feature. 1957's Attack of the Crab Monsters was the highest grossing film of his early career. Some critics have even argued that Jaws was nothing more than a highly polished Roger Corman production, so it's only fitting that it would have a rated R knockoff from the master. The director, Joe Don was also no stranger to the creature feature. I saw them when I was a kid, which scared me to death, and um, I was convinced there were giant ants outside my window because the crickets sounded like ants, and then there would be these tree, tree br branches that would hit my window pane, and I was sure that those were ant antennas. After spending time at the Philadelphia College of Art, Dante would realize that his true passion lied in filmmaking. While assembling clips for his 1968 experimental film, The Movie Orgy, Dante would reach out to his hero. I had Roger Corman buttons made for people to wear so, so that you could identify yourself as a Cormanite as opposed to a Nudardite. Whoa. And uh, I took the liberty of sending one to Roger. And uh, he sent me a note back saying what good taste I had. Corman wouldn't forget about Dante, and a few years later, 
After editing the trailer for Jonathan Demme's Caged Heat, he became a regular editor for New World Pictures. Dante would finally get a chance at directing when he convinced Roger Corman that he could make the cheapest film in New World Pictures history. It was a modest success and convinced the King of the Bees enough that he could later trust Dante to direct Piranha. Universal was initially shocked at the idea of a parody of the beloved Jaws, so shocked that they almost got an injunction against the film to prevent it from releasing before Spielberg stepped in and gave it his blessing. Despite a modest success at the box office, Dante would continue as editor at New World Pictures. Spielberg wouldn't forget about Dante, but for now, he was far more interested in the John Sayles script and hired him to write the initial draft for his upcoming project. Night Skies. The film was being developed out of a contractual obligation with Columbia Pictures, who demanded a sequel to the smash hit Close Encounters of the Third Kind. After grossing more than $100 million in the fall of 1977, effectively saving the studio overnight, Columbia was desperate for a follow-up, and Spielberg wanted to take the sequel in a more horror-themed direction. Where Close Encounters had focused on a more sentimental and pleasant experience, Night Skies would be far more sinister. The story centered on a rural family's encounter with a group of aliens who were both experimental and hostile, going so far as mutilating livestock and murdering humans. But as the months progressed and nearly one million dollars was put into pre-production, Spielberg was starting to get wet feet. While filming Raiders of the Lost Ark, the desert landscape of Tunisia was giving him a sense of loneliness he had felt as a child. His heart was in another area. Quote, I might have taken leave of my senses. Throughout the production of Raiders, I was in between killing Nazis and blowing up flying wings and having Harrison Ford and all this high serialized adventure. I was sitting there in the middle of Tunisia, scratching my head and saying, I've got to get back to the tranquility, or at least spirituality, of Close Encounters. Screenwriter Melissa Matheson, who was visiting her then-boyfriend and future husband Harrison Ford on the set of Raiders and had been given a copy of the sales script, agreed with Spielberg's change of heart. She disliked the violent aspects of the script, but she was moved to tears by a subplot about a friendly alien and a young boy of the family striking up a friendship. Feeling that she had a great idea on her hands, she worked on the script with Spielberg over the next eight weeks and eventually called it a boy's life. Spielberg immediately identified with the lead character, Elliot. That's when and everything kind of like changed in my in my mind and it, it sort of became I'm not gonna make that movie but I might make this movie. In the fall of 1980, Spielberg would release the special edition of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The new version did well enough that he was released from his contractual obligations for a sequel. He believed that elements of the Night Sky script could still work. Unfortunately, since he had chosen to direct E.T., he was now forbidden by Universal from directing any other projects. Not wanting the concept to fade away, he began actively searching for a new director to fill the role. The natural choice was Toby Hooper. After 1974's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a film which Spielberg deeply admired, Hooper had cemented himself as a genius of low-budget filmmaking. 1981 had given him a minor success with his slasher film The Fun House, but he was eager to show Hollywood what he could do with a substantial budget. Hooper was unimpressed by the alien aspects of the script, but was fascinated by the idea of a suburban horror story and wondered if it would work with ghosts instead. Television writers Michael Grace and Mark Victor were brought in to flesh out the script, and soon both E.T. and Poltergeist had reached active development. In early summer 1981, principal photography on Poltergeist began, with Hooper behind the camera and Spielberg handling all production duty. This new story focused on a suburban couple played by Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams, as well as their three children, the youngest of which Carol Ann is kidnapped by a dark and evil presence, demanding that they bring in paranormal investigators and eventually a spiritual medium. Much like Jaws, Poltergeist focuses on external forces, with the notable change being the heavy emphasis on childhood fear, something that's going to play a larger role in episodes two and three. After filming and wrapped in the first week of August, Hooper would spend the next couple of months assembling a rough cut of the film, while Spielberg left for industrial light and magic to assist with the visual and sound effects before taking his leave and going to the set of E.T. By late 1981, visual effects and sound work were completed, and promotional artwork was commissioned by MGM. All the film needed was a rating. MGM president Frank Rosenfeld had been salivating at the idea of what the Spielberg production could do to his alien company ever since the film had been put 
into active development. Much like the dire straits Columbia Pictures had been in when Spielberg had directed Close Encounters, MGM had been purchased by United Artists earlier that year and was teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. The $10 million budget or $35 million when adjusted for inflation, marked a considerable investment on their part to save their skins. And with Spielberg attached, a name synonymous with bombastic PG-rated popcorn pushers, they couldn't lose. So you can imagine the shock at MGM when they received word from the Classification and Rating Administration that their new film would not be receiving the same audience-friendly rating as Jaws, Close Encounters, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But the more restrictive R rating putting it in league with Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Feeling their dreams were about to be ruined, MGM decided to file an appeal and planned to change their marketing strategy. This is an extremely rare promotional art piece and perhaps the only one produced with the initial R rating. It wound up in the hands of a collector who waited several years before tracking down Toby Hooper at a local convention and presenting it to him. Having not seen the original artwork in decades, Hooper was ecstatic. He was said to have exclaimed, Oh, that's great! As he traced his finger over the three quotes used, marveling at the shot of the neighborhood and questioning why it was never used. After holding the artwork for a considerable amount of time, Hooper made the collector an offer, which he refused. After declining several more offers, the collector eventually walked away with Hooper's signature and his phone number in case he ever changed his mind. Unfortunately, Hooper would pass away in 2017 and the artwork would never enter his private collection. It would eventually be listed in an eBay auction for $2,700, later marked down to $1,300, before being removed from the site, presumably purchased in early 2023. But back in 1982, the problem with the R rating still lingered. During a chance encounter in late April, just weeks before the poltergeist appeal, Spielberg would give CARA President Richard Hefner a ride to LA International Airport. While cruising along the highway, Spielberg reminded Hefner about the debacle over Jaws and the previous year's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hefner remembered when he had allowed face-melting Nazis and several gruesome headshots into a PG film, he had opened up the floodgates for violence. Spielberg insisted that as the years passed, more filmmakers would continue to push the envelope and that a new rating, something along the lines of a PG-12, would be needed. Hefner agreed. In 1976, during the lengthy appeal process for all the president's men, he had felt a change needed to come. The only thing that had been standing in his way then was Motion Picture Association of America President Jack Valenny, who had penned the rating system himself and was adamant that there should be no changes. He had already made a fool of himself when his initial M rating was mistaken for a higher and more restrictive rating than R. It was replaced by GP, only to be replaced again one year later by PG. Hefner had been privately calling his new creation PGM, and when he stepped out of Spielberg's car at LA International National Airport, he agreed that he would begin shopping the idea around to industry leaders. But back at the MBAA, the counsel for the Classification and Ratings Board, William Nix, warned Jack Valenti that there was a potential conflict of interest. As stated previously, MGM had been purchased earlier that year by United Artists, and Nix stated that if the representative from UA were allowed to vote in the Poltergeist appeal, it could open up Carrot to criticism that would completely destroy their reputation. Jack Valenti didn't give a shit. He had given preferential treatment to dozens of studio films over the years, including Blade Runner which months earlier had the same conflict of interest as Poltergeist now, but they had ended up losing and walking away with an R. Valenti dismissed any criticism and insisted the representative from United Artists be allowed to cast his vote. When the day of the appeal arrived, Hefner was under a tremendous amount of pressure. Spielberg himself had showed up, along with MGM president Frank Rosenfeld, who couldn't help but reveal himself. After the film was screened for members of the appeals board, he began by insisting that an R rating would completely devastate their company. Having their film reach the widest audience possible was the only thing that could save them. Poltergeist had no sexual content, very little profanity, and any violence was not explicit or permanent. No, no, nobody dies in the film. To strengthen his case, he brought in child psychologist Dr. Alfred Jones, who posed that the fantasy element cast over the film kept it from being excessively violent and also from being potentially harmful to children in the future. It was after he sat down that Richard Hefner stood up and shocked the members of the room. Poltergeist had not received an R for violence, but the terror induced by the soundtrack. To be fair, he had a point. <laughs> The 
The 1970s had brought about many cinematic innovations, and one of the most influential would be Dolby Stereo. Prior to its creation, most theaters had been offering single-track mono-oral. Dolby had created a way to separate the channel into a left and right, as well as a center and an optional fourth track for ambient sounds in the theater. This completely transformed the cinematic experience, and audiences everywhere took notice. After massive hits like Star Wars and Superman had utilized the technology to great effect, by 1982, less than one-third of cinemas in America were operating on mono sound. Despite these successes, Hefner argued that there had yet to be a wide-release, family-oriented horror film that had used this technique. That same year, Dolby Stereo was set to become available for home use. Unlike Jack Valenny, Hefner did not underestimate the video market. He described a future in which children everywhere were being terrified in their own homes while watching this and future films. Stereo could have horrible implications on children in the future. <laughs> At this point, I imagine Spielberg had to stifle a laugh. After all, this had been the point the entire time. Real scary. <laughs> it's real scary. As John Williams was busy working on the soundtrack for E.T., Spielberg had specifically chosen Jerry Goldsmith, known for his Oscar-winning score for The Omen, stating, quote, With Spielberg, Probably more than any other director, there's a tremendous amount of discussion. He's very articulate about music, and one can discuss for hours about approaches. Anything I did was not of my own volition. It was a joint effort in that we both agreed what we were trying to do with the music for the picture. We wanted a childlike theme for the little girl. Spielberg felt that much of the action in the closet should have a quasi-religious atmosphere to it. There was something definitely not human about it, yet it was not evil all the way. An approach which ultimately worked. It terrified everyone who saw it. Real scary. <laughs> it's real scary. Although Hefner had brought up several points about the technology of the future, nearly everyone agreed that the potential impacts on children would be small at best. The members of the appeals board would cast their vote, and Poltergeist's R rating would be overturned to BG. 20 to 4. When the film finally released to theaters, the classification board received a large portion of criticism. This movie is about a little girl who finds out that her, the toys in her bedroom are going to try to strangle her, that people are in her bedroom closet and going to pull yeah. her out of bed and take her away from mommy and daddy. This is a PG rated film. I think for young kids it's too strong. If I had seen this movie when I was seven, I would have been afraid to go to bed until I was 12. I think it's done. Hefner stated, quote, People in the know came to believe we could be had. MGM President Frank Rosenfeld was pissed that Hefner had fought for an R rating. In a slimy maneuver, Vlenny told him that this would likely be brought up during the latest meeting of the board of directors. Fearing for his job, Hefner would put away his dreams of a new rating for the next two years. Poltergeist and E.T. would release one week apart on June 6th and 11th, 1982. Dubbed The Summer of Spielberg, both films would do extremely well at the box office, with Poltergeist becoming the eighth highest grossing film of the year and E.T. becoming the then highest grossing film of all time. Two years later, Spielberg would helm two more summer projects. Only this time, change would come. Okay. I think Poltergeist is too scary for some children, but I think that's why the film is rated PG. I think that young children will, might have nightmares if they see the film, but that's of course responsible parents. It's up to them to say to their kids that they can control their children. You shouldn't go see this movie I've seen, and I think it's too scary for you. I didn't make the film to force American children into bed with their parents, but if it happens, it'll just bring families closer together. <laughs> Children are regularly terrified.